Stay with General Kenobi. I'm on my way. Better hurry, sir. You're missing all the fun. Hello everybody and welcome back to Space Dog. I'm Hujuana and yes, I have a new microphone and I'm using it today to talk about giant monsters and kaiju because they're really cool. While they are all over fantasy, we'll be focusing on the sci-fi side of things, starting with a selection of games that include them but are not solely about them, like Mass Effect's Thresher Moors, the larger Terminators and Helldivers, Subnautica's Leviathans and various things in Warframe. I bring up these game ones specifically because they often act as boss fights and may have special mechanics associated with them that take advantage of their size. I particularly like the Threshermore in Mass Effect 3 because it's a bit of an inversion of this since you use it to defeat a boss instead. In Subnautica you can take them on in this fashion but they're much more of an environmental hazard, something terrifying that announces its presence through audio before you ever even see them, which really makes you want to not see whatever is making that scary noise. Of course, there's a lot of other forms of media beyond games that have big monsters in without strictly being about them, like Power Rangers. From what I remember of the original show, the episodes usually ended with a big boss fight of their own against a gigantified version of the antagonist of that episode, so there's sort of a link here to those games I mentioned. But equally, it happened so often that while the show wasn't about them, it sort of was in a way. Which takes us to the subgenre of giant monster media, where they are the star of the show, and we just have to talk about dinosaurs here. There's a lot of things based around dinosaurs around, from the very first giant monster movie to ones around today. They're basically their own little sub subgenre, and a very popular one at that, because dinos were real and are cool. There's just something so special about knowing that these creatures actually existed. It helps to capture the imagination when we see them stomping around and roaring in movies and stuff. One of the other earliest giant monster movies was King Kong, which was all about the spectacle and remains a very popular franchise to this day. The original movie has been read as being a racist allegory, but the creators continually insisted that it wasn't. It's certainly a product of its time though, and you can make up your own mind over what meaning, if any, that first movie has. While Star Wars has its fair share of big monsters like the Sarlacc and Bigger Fish, the Clone Wars TV show did a full-on homage to the giant monster movie genre with the Zillow Beast. It's a pretty neat two-parter with the way it reframes the big monster movie tropes in the context of the Star Wars universe. More recently, there was also the Crate Dragon in The Mandalorian, which was a similar monster-focused plot, but it was used to tell the story of the peoples of the desert banding together to achieve a greater goal. Another modern example is Pacific. Pacific Rim, which was an instant classic with how big and weighty everything felt, and the way the scenes are framed as being from the point of view of an observer on the ground. It really makes the kaiju feel appropriately gigantic, especially the very first one when it breaks through the Golden Gate Bridge. Especially the very first one when it breaks through the Golden Gate Bridge. Especially the very first one when it breaks through the Golden Gate Bridge. Also, how cool was it that they all had different designs and awesome names? Oh, and the way they were all categorised from 1 to 5 based on size and strength like hurricanes, which brings us into huge monsters being forces of nature. For this, I just have to go to the Sandworms of Dune, since in some ways they are an embodiment of the deserts of Arrakis. The spice being part of their life cycle makes them the entire reason the planet is important, and they're also a big part of what makes it deadly. Yes, there's the immense heat and total lack of moisture, but the worms are on another level entirely, capable of consuming even the big spice harvesters. They're another force of nature on par with the mighty sandstorms that rage across the deserts. They are just as unstoppable and only those with deep knowledge and respect for them can adequately survive on the surface, or even gain power over them. As such, they play a deep role in the Fremen culture and religion. To them, the worms are mythology and legend, but fully realised, and that is the inspiration that Frank Herbert used for them. Shaihalud are akin to dragons that guard a great treasure, though they do not do so deliberately. There have been many versions of the sandworms over the years, but one of my favourites is Alex J. Brady's sidewinding take with the deep internal heat made visible, which makes them feel volcanic, which is just brilliant. 
The Villeneuve movie's versions of them is great as well, with the rock-like scales and filter-feeding star teeth that likens them to a whale. In fact, there's a few things about this version of them that makes them feel like sea creatures, like the waves in the sand here or the spray that whips up on Paul's first ride. I bring that up because so many kaiju and megafauna in general come from the sea. Mythology is absolutely full of sea creatures like Scylla and Charybdis, the Leviathan, the Kraken, Jormungandr, and more generic ones like sea serpents. This stems from how dangerous the oceans are, and from the nature of its depths being relatively unexplored. There's lots of known large sea creatures like whales and giant squid, so what else is lurking down there in the deep, dark unknown? Modern day pop culture has even more sea creatures, some of which are based on those mythological ones, and others are less fanciful, like giant sharks or things in that vein. And of course, the king of the monsters himself, Godzilla. He's an ancient, nigh-invulnerable monster that was woken by nuclear testing in the Pacific, and is best known for attacking ships, islands, and the city of Tokyo, as well as his devastating atomic breath. He's a force of nature who is just as destructive as the weapons that awoke him, but is seemingly unstoppable on top of that. He's like a typhoon or earthquake, something completely out of control and utterly devastating, with the twist that he was awoken by mankind. The themes surrounding his original appearance are pretty obvious here, especially as World War II ended only a decade earlier, and the fallout from American nuclear testing was actively harming or even killing Japanese people at the time. And that level of storytelling is definitely something that some other movies in the 70 year long franchise have touched upon or even surpassed. Shin Godzilla was inspired by the terrible 2001 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami, and the following Fukushima nuclear disaster. Godzilla Minus One brought things down to a more personal level, and was about duty and helping one another, with the great and terrible monster himself being the driver of that plot. But the character has many renditions outside of those more serious movies, with different ones being made for the Japanese or Western audience. There's the goofy, there's the disliked, there's the weird and the beloved. Across all his various incarnations, he just hits everything that I've talked about so far that makes a giant monster cool. He's a boss fight, he fights other big monsters, he's dinosaur-like, he's the catalyst for human-level storytelling, he comes from the sea, he can be utterly terrifying, he can be an impersonal force of nature or a characterful protagonist. Godzilla is just THE Kaiju. Which is why he basically popularised the giant monster genre, and remains such a core part of it today. Overall, giant monsters are surprisingly versatile. They can be used to tell all sorts of stories at all sorts of scales, or just be used to add some flavour to the world building of a setting. In the end, there's just something intangibly awesome about seeing huge creatures walking about doing stuff, and that comes through in other genres too, like mechs. Something deep in our brains sees these impossible things and goes, hell yeah. You can support Space Talk by joining our Patreon, where you can get our frigate and space fighter design reference books. Alternatively, you can support us directly through YouTube by becoming a channel member. Thanks to our supporters, and thank you for watching.